Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle DeMarzo, the Fairfield University Art Museum's Curator of Education and Academic Engagement. It's my pleasure to welcome you to another one of our quick live sessions. If you were with us last night when we were sketching birds from our Birds of the Northeast Gulls to Great Auk Show, now we are going to be pivoting tonight to fashion and to our other exhibition on the work of Lala Asadi within our Walsh Gallery. If you haven't had a chance to check out the exhibition, you can do so at our website, which is www.fairfield.edu slash museum slash Lala Asadi. You'll see her name on the screen in just a few moments. I am delighted to be welcoming another member of the Fairfield University faculty and community uh, this evening to be our speaker, Julie Levitt Learson. She is an MFA costume designer, theater educator, and passionate fashion history buff. As costumier for the Fairfield University Theater Program, she designs and builds costumes for theater Fairfield productions, manages the costume shop, and mentors student theater artists and technicians. Her theater Fairfield costume design credits include Silent Sky, The Taming of the Shrew, Dead Man's Cell Phone, The Arabian Nights, and The Rocky Horror, among others. Julie holds an MFA in costume design from Northwestern University, and a BA in theater and English literature from the University of New Hampshire, University of New Hampshire, excuse me. Before she came to Fairfield, Julie was an assistant professor of English at Westfield State College, the assistant costume designer at Chicago's Goodman Theater, and a freelance costume designer at Too Many Theaters to name here. She's also collaborated with Shakespeareans Productions in Waterbury, Connecticut, costuming Shakespeare from Comedy of Errors to King Lear, as well as The Sword in the Stone and Alice in Wonderland. Please join me in welcoming Julie Learson. Well, hi, thank you. Um, it is a pleasure to be here this evening and thank you to Michelle DeMarzo and to Carrie Weber for inviting me to speak with you this evening. Um, as Michelle mentioned, I am a theatrical costume designer with an MFA in costume design. And costume design is a multidisciplinary field our work incorporates fashion history and text analysis, uh, human psychology, anthropology, lots of communication skills, grounding in visual art um, and textile studies, just to name a few um, areas of expertise we're called upon to use regularly. Our job is to serve the director's vision in interpreting a play by creating costumes that communicate character to the audience. And so, it is in my capacity as a costume designer that I wanted to speak to you this evening about Lala Asadi's work. Because while her work is not dressing actors for stage plays, her design aesthetic in creating the worlds um, she, she develops for her photographs um, has much in common with that of a costume designer. Her photos, just like a costume designer's rendering, create characters in worlds that invite us to make meaning from what we see. So I wanted to take a few minutes, first of all, um, to discuss some of the art of costume design. Um, costume is more than just the clothes a character wears. I say this to my students all the time. It's never just clothes. The term costume uh, includes hair and makeup, accessories, footwear, and other adornment, including um, you know, piercings and tattoos and things like that. Um, it also encompasses how the body moves. Um, and behaves when dressed in these various um, pieces of fashion. And costume can communicate volumes to an audience revealing many details about a character's age and their gender, their socioeconomic status, their occupation, their personality and their state of mind, um, their ethnicity, religious leanings, all kinds of things about their personal um, inner life and their place in society. Costume also gives us a real grounding um, in, with a sense of time and place, you know, and that includes in the, the big picture sense of, you know, which century and on which continent is this character living. And it also means kind of in the smaller specifics like the time of day, um, the time of year, um, and the specific occasion for which that character um, has gotten dressed and entered the stage. Um, but beyond that, costume can uh, communicate the degree of realism or abstraction, you know, departures from realism in the piece of theater. Um, they can make overt or subtle connections between characters and evoke an emotional response from an audience. So in short, 
costume reveal both character and mood and assist in this world building. Which brings us to Lala Asadi. Um, she chooses to photograph women from her community in Morocco. And then she chooses to dress them in traditional feminine garments from her culture and set them against Moroccan architecture like you see here. Um, this is a photograph um, titled Harem Revisited, number 14C. Um, and so she sets them against this Moroccan architecture with furnishings and textiles that are all of, of the sense of place. Um, and many of these visual elements were created decades or sometimes even centuries ago, but Isadi isn't trying to recreate a specific moment from the past. She, instead, she is drawing on these historical elements to speak to contemporary Moroccan feminine identity which fascinates me. Um, viewers who are unfamiliar with Moroccan dress and domestic architecture get to be transported to a world that's both of this moment and evocative of the past. And this is often the goal with theatrical costume design, especially when we're working on a play um, that was written or set in an earlier historical period. We wanna get the sense of that historical period while still inviting our audience members to connect emotionally with the characters from a place of empathy. We want audience members to see themselves in their characters. And I think this is something that Lala Asadi does with her photography. Uh, so um, you can see this kind of design aesthetic in contemporary costume designers like Paul Taswell's designs for the musical Hamilton or Ruthie Carter's designs for the Marvelverse film, The Black Panther um, and um, Ellen Mirajnik's designs for the Netflix series Bridgerton and lots and lots and lots of other works. This is very much of the moment um, developing um, this flavor of history and still this sense of very much in the now. So to return to Lala Asadi, um, Dressing actors in costumes to create characters and help world build, um, a costume designer is, is going to be using four basic tools to achieve this um, effect. Um, and here they are listed. We've got silhouette, which is the shape of the outline of the body when wearing a costume. Texture, which is the textiles and the materials that are used to create the articles of dress. Color, which we all understand, and that can be full of situational and historical and emotional context, and then accents, which is jewelry, could be color contrast on the garments, um, embellishments like embroidery or accessories that are gonna draw the eye. And this is where Lala Asadi really thinks like a costume designer to go beyond the realistically dressed figure and create her stunning portraits like we see here from Harem Revisited. So I wanna start with silhouette. Right, um, and how a costume designer uses it. You can see here, here are two uh, fashionable French silhouettes from different eras. Um, and if we're looking at just the outline of this body, you can see that silhouette is going to reveal or conceal or distort or manipulate uh, the natural human figure by draping or tailoring cloth around the human form and by using artificial structures to uh, change proportions, right? So anything from shoulder pads to high-heeled shoes to corsets and hoop skirts do this. Um, even Marie Antoinette's wig and feathers over here is, is you know, adding length to her, her height here. Um, so you can see um, these are the fashionable silhouettes from different eras in European history. And then here is um, a silhouette of a traditional um, Moroccan um, garment. Um, because Moroccan traditional attire has endured for centuries, even as, has, even as it has adapted to the ever-changing fashion impulse. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little further about a few examples of traditional Moroccan attire, um, particularly for women. Um, and there are three garments that I'm going to talk about and then show you examples of them in Lala Asadi's work. And it's the kaftan, the takchida, and the hike. And forgive my pronunciation if I'm not um, well versed in how to pronounce them well. Um, so here we have uh, a Moroccan kaftan from the mid 20th century. And this is courtesy of the Zay exhibit. Um, and kaftans have been worn, like I said, for centuries by both men and women. And now in Morocco, the kaftan is pretty much exclusively a woman's garment. And um, 
just discussing its silhouette, it's a rectangular or column garment with sleeves. Um, and it's loose and uh, tends to be flowing. It can be um, opened, it tends to be opened at the front, generally has long wide sleeves, although sleeve shape um, does vary. And it can be made from a wide variety of fabrics and be embellished with embroidery or beads or lace or other trims. Um, and often that center front closure has that decorative trim around it to draw attention to it. And it often closes uh, with buttons. And we have this tendency to think of traditional dress of non-European communities as static, that it's kind of rigidly unchanging, but caftans have been reinvented for hundreds of years by changing the fullness or the sleeve length or the fabrics and the decoration. Um, here's another example. This one is from 1925. You can see it's also from um, the Zay archive and it's a little bit fuller cut. The sleeves are a little bit different. We have this different embellishment here on the front um, and this like the other one um, is a silk brocade and they were both um, woven in Morocco. And so these textile designs of these flowers um, and other imagery are, are being woven um, within the country of Morocco, but are certainly influenced by um, fashion impulses from France and from China and from everywhere in between along the Silk Road. So here we can see a photograph. This is a detail um, from the harem uh, number 11 from 2009. We can see here two women in uh, caftans, right? Here's that center front closure. One is a little bit more narrow. One is a little bit more full. We've got the wide sleeves here. Her sleeves are a little bit more narrow. So we're seeing that um, variety in the dress. Um, in this image, um, while the silhouette is traditional, um, the fabric is newly woven for this project and printed to reproduce the designs in the architecture and the tile work around the women. So it's taking a, a traditional old garment and, and doing something new with it. Right, you can see from uh, these vintage postcards of Moroccan women in traditional dress um, from in the 20th century at different periods, right? Asadi is stripping down this historic silhouette and kind of asking us to look more closely at the women who are clothed within these garments. This is uh, another traditional garment from Morocco. It's called the takjida and it's actually a two-piece dress. So you can see there's, there's um, uh, over the head closed, um, close fitting planer dress that's worn underneath uh, this open front, um, you know, similar to a kaftan. When, when they are combined in this outfit, we have the tahita and the dafina. And then this is further accented with a belt that can be cinched um, tightly or a little bit less so, um, depending on what you want for your effect. Um, so it's this fabric sash. Um, and so you can see, even though the body is entirely covered because we have this belt here, this is a little bit more form revealing than the long and the loose caftans from the previous slides. Um, this is a very contemporary um, outfit here that I, that I pulled from the internet. Um, and this is typically worn by Moroccan women um, for weddings or other formal occasions like that. But here in this slide um, from Harem Revisited, number 17, and Dr. Cynthia Becker, who gave a talk earlier this spring, she described this um, outfit in her talk as two caftans layered on top of one another. And I I'm gonna defer to her expertise on this, but what it reminded me of, this layering of the two garments for the takchita. And you can see that there's, there's color contrast, but there's similarity, um, but we have these different, um, brocade uh, patterns here. We have different um, trimming down the front. And um, by having her recline, we are seeing um, that underlayer as well as the overlayer. Uh, and by posing this figure in this photo in repose and in a, a real private informal setting, Lala Asadi is kind of upending that idea of the takchita as a formal garment worn for public events. And then here's the haik, um, which is um, a traditional garment. It's a long cloak that covers the body um, basically from head to toe. So it's an outdoor garment. Traditionally, it was made of both silk and wool, sometimes both together. And it is traditionally white in color. Um, and it's designed to conceal the entire figure, as you can see here in this painting from the 19th century by Alexandra Hirsch. 
Um, so leaving only the eyes and the hands uh, visible. So this garment has um, religious connotations and kind of roots in modest dress. Um, but the color white also serves a real practical purpose um, in a place like Morocco where it's quite warm and often quite sunny because the white color is going to reflect that sunlight back and that's going to keep the figure cooler than would if the body were dressed in um, a darker color. Um, so it serves a very practical purpose as well as as cultural. And as you can see, it is a garment that has endured. This is a photograph taken in the 1980s. And then here, Lala Asadi um, using uh, uh, Converging Territories, number two. Here, she's dressed her subject in her version of the hike. And instead of keeping it this plain white garment, she has covered it in Arabic writing done in henna. Um, and as Dr. Becker talked about in her lecture, um, this is a very uh, kind of transgressive um, symbolic act that she's doing. Henna um, applied to the skin is a traditional feminine uh, body modification, again, often done for weddings and other ceremonial uh, events. But writing in Arabic had long been considered the purview of uh, a man's domain. And so for Lala Asadi to, to combine this feminine art of henna with the masculine art of writing and then putting it onto this garment. Um, it's just kind of breathtaking uh, to me to, to look at it. Um, so it's really playing up this idea of this silhouette that's designed to conceal the body and then just broadcasting this woman's thoughts through the writing. But of course, Lala Asadi um, doesn't really want us to be able to read the writing. It, it's pretty um, indecipherable by design um, because the woman's thoughts are private. Um, but here, the, we, the viewer, we can see that this woman is a thinking, feeling, conscious, and engaged human being, even though she's largely concealed. So you can see how Lala Asadi is using her, uh, her knowledge of Moroccan fashion and culture to create images that are both steeped in the past and speaking to contemporary viewers. Um, so more than just simply recreating the past, she's asking us to think about how women like her have been uh, viewed in the past, how women are viewed now, and how our viewpoints can be changed by engaging with her art. I wanted to move on to talk about some of those other um, design uh, tools, so texture, color, and accent. Um, and so again, I have some more vintage postcards here and then a contemporary fashion uh, image. Um, so texture is determined largely by the materials that we use to create the garment or other article of adornment like jewelry, etc. And different fabrics are going to behave differently on the body. And we know this from how we dress, you know, a, a, a flowy silk blouse is going to behave differently than a wool sweater. It's going to behave differently than a Gore-Tex raincoat uh, and on and on and on, right? Because some fabrics are going to move with the body as it moves or they're going to weigh the body down or they're going to create uh, kind of a stiff armor, if you will, over and about the body. Morocco uh, has been a center for textile production for centuries, taking silk and cotton from Asia and the Middle East and turning it into sumptuous, sumptuous cloth that then gets traded to Europe and other places, um, and specializing in things like rich silk brocades with metallic trim and thread and some delicate semi-transparent silks. And so you can see this variety of texture here uh, in these postcards. And again, um, here in the, the lady here on the right, you can see how the embellishment, the embroidery, how its placement and its um, scale is drawing the eye up from the hem, up the torso to the face. And so in theater, we want to draw the audience's, actually here, let me go back to this slide and keep here for a moment. In theater, we want to draw the audience's attention to the most important character on the stage at any given moment. And we then want to draw the audience's gaze to an actor's face and hands because that's where the bulk of the communication uh, is being conveyed. Um, and so we do this by creating color contrast in the garment, sometimes by adding flashy accessories like earrings or makeup, right? Um, uh, and by creating shapes within the style lines of an outfit that draw the eye's attention to a particular area, which is what I was just showing you here. But to go back to Lala Asadi's work, um, 
we've seen several images of women dressed in these sumptuous traditional textiles with rich colors and lots of pattern and they have lots of jewelry on um, but in this image which is from harem from 2009 the printed pattern of the kaftan textile is merging with the tile of the floor um, and so it's really difficult to understand where the textile and garment ends and where the architecture begins. So it's almost like camouflage. Um, so it kind of is hiding the woman who's clothed within the caftan. But you can see this solid black or very dark blue line that's going up the center front of the caftan draws our eye all the way up to the neck. And then we see her face. And then we have this other color contrast with her dark hair framing her face. Um, and her dark brows. So, so um, we really see her face kind of emerging from this camouflage background. Um, and then, of course, the other thing that Lala Asadi has done has covered the, her sitter's face with more of that henna um, and the Arabic writing. Um, and so um, we can see that on her hands and her feet as well. But this is really kind of the thing that draws our attention because it's unlike other things on the image. And she does it to really stunning effect to me here. If you get a chance to go into the gallery and see these works, I'm showing you images on my screen, um, but they are quite large in person, you know, larger than life, many of them, and, and they are really stunning to look at in person. Um, so we have this one, um, again, right, using, using this um, body modification technique that women apply to their hands and feet for weddings. And she's used, um, they often employ kind of abstract designs of images and flowers and fertility symbols. But by using this Arabic script instead, uh, Asadi is kind of merging this feminine method of adornment with a masculine form of communication. And by covering both the body and the garment in this henna script, Asadi is really blurring the lines between the figure and background. But then that just draws our attention further to the unhenned portion of the body. And, you know, we look right into her eyes in this frame because it is, it is the least busy. And so it's arresting and it draws our gaze. So she uses color and accent to focus our, our gaze. Um, and in her later collections, this is from, uh, a collection called Bullets. Um, Asadi explores her mastery of accent even further by turning bullets and shell casings into trim and jewelry, which you can see here, obviously in the background, and then along the neckline of the garment, and then along the edging of the veil. And this just kind of stuns me how, how she manages to do this. She's applying these um, in areas and in patterns that are similar to uh, traditional embellishment like embroidery or lace. And so at first glance, we might not realize that this is you know, repurposed ammunition. Um, but because of the brassy you know, metallic sheen of these bullets and casings, they immediately draw our eye because they glitter. Um, and by framing her sitter's face with this glittery veil she's giving her you know this this really um almost mystical kind of aura um around the subject that i think is quite arresting um and, and i think we should point out that that when she uses these these kind of bullet encrusted uh garments these are really true theatrical props they are not practical for street wear. they're quite heavy quite cumbersome they often need lots of um, assistance to get them draped around the body um in a way that isn't going to to um hurt the sitter. Um, so they're, they're definitely theatrical in that sense as well. Um, in my last few slides, I just wanted to show you um, how Asadi's art is in conversation. Um, I wanted to zoom out a little bit to this idea of costume communicating character, because I um, love this idea of art always being in kind of constant communication and conversation with other art. And Asadi is really clever and pointed in how she's using her voice. Um, European and American artists have for centuries, you know, otherized, they've exoticized or eroticized women from non-European cultures and really kind of inviting a voyeurist gaze to, you know, ogle the subjects of their paintings. And we can see this in this um, 1814 painting by Jean-Auguste uh, Dominique Ingres, right, which is the La Grande Odalisque, right, um, Odalisque referring to the harem where women are kept sequestered um, from men in service to the Sultan. And as you can see, Asadi is very consciously posing her model 
um, a la La Grande Odalisk here in uh, her, her, her photo, Bullets Revisited, uh, number 38. Um, but she's using those bullet uh, embellished fabrics that are in that traditional Moroccan silhouette. And again, the henna writing on her skin. Oh, and so the surroundings are really rich and sumptuous. Again, it's thanks to the bullets in the shell casing. And to me, this comparison is really striking. It's, it's really asking me to reconsider unconscious biases on, on several levels. I wanted to show you another comparison. Um, this is on the left, a painting by Henri Matisse, Odalisque Jouant aux Dames, um, playing games. And you can see what looks like a chessboard or checkerboard there. And um, either a samovar or hookah on the side there reclining. One is clothed in kind of exotic clothing and one is reclining nude. Um, because costume is, uh, assists with world building as well. And so that's why I wanna show you this side-by-side -side comparison. Um, so uh, while Matisse's women are kind of enjoying this life of voluptuous indulgence with food and wine and playing games in their confined quarters, um, and while Angra's painting in the slide before was decidedly realistic, you know, very beautifully, meticulously recreating light and shadow to give us, um, you know, the, the surface appearance of reality. Matisse is an impressionist. He's giving us the emotional impression of the scene and not worrying so much about the specific photorealistic details, right? Um, but uh, Asadi takes this abstraction further with her painting here, Les Femmes de Morocco, The Women of Morocco. Um, number 30. And she's kind of pulled all of the color out of her surroundings, which is a real marked contrast to Matisse's here. We're all in white with the henna writing and it's the, the couch that they're sitting on, the pillows, the drapes behind them, their clothing, um, and then the, the book that the lady on the right is reading. Um, and so they're kind of at one in there with their surroundings as opposed to kind of these um, examples of exoticism on display and their their reading. Um, I look at this and I feel like she she's reading to her companion here um, in this photograph. Uh, and so it's a world in which the, the women are completely at home. They're pleasing no one but themselves and each other and their thoughts are private, but we're getting this sense of these lively minds engaged in conversation. Um, and, a, and a much richer interior life than these more exotic portraits would, would let us suggest. So with my last slide, I wanna to return to one of her earlier works, Silence of Thought number two. Um, and I would just like to applaud the work of Lala Asadi. It has been a real pleasure for me to explore these worlds that she creates with her work and the characters that she inhabits in them and her real skillful use of costume design techniques to communicate with her viewers. And though photographs don't tell us stories in the same way that actors deliver a causally structured plot and dialogue, I feel a real kinship with uh, Asadi's approach to her work. Like audiences at a play, we viewers become flies on a wall watching these women's lives. Um, and so that ends my talk. I wanted to thank you all for your time this evening and I'm happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Great. Well, thank you so much, Julie. That was awesome. And anyone who's watching who'd like to um, give uh, or send any questions Julie's way, please type them into the chat and our friendly tech will let us know that we've got some. But I've got one to start with. And that is, um, I know from Dr. Becker's talk that um, Lala Asadi relies on the collaboration of a lot of other women to make all of this work possible. I mean, not least you highlighted the bullet um, outfits, which require so much hand sewing of these small sliced open bullets that if she was doing it all herself, there's just no way any of the costumes would be ready in time to take the shot. Um, and I was wondering how that sort of um, applies in the costumier world. So what what is the kind of collaboration that you rely on to get this sort of work done? Certainly, right. It definitely does take a village to, to uh, create costumes for a show. Um, it, it can be done singly, but oh boy. Uh, and it's, it's much more uh, fun and I think rewarding when, when we have um, other people engaged in the work. So typically we have the designer who meets with the director and the actors and develops the look of the show. And they usually communicate those ideas through drawings um, or paintings um, or sometimes through collage and, and other forms like that. Um, but then we have the costume technicians and makers. So we have drapers who will take the cloth and figure out how to turn um, a two-dimensional drawing into a three-dimensional garment um, and they will develop a pattern. 
Um, there are going to be stitchers, um, might be tailors, might be seamstresses, depending on what kind of garment is being made. Um, and then, you know, a, a well-run uh, professional shop that, that you know, is, is doing a full season of shows might have, you know, a dozen um, employed. Um, smaller shops will have fewer and people kind of take on more roles, but you might have somebody whose job is to make hats and bonnets or somebody who jo whose job is to, um, you know, make the costume crafts, whether it's jewelry or footwear or, you know, flower corsages or whatever the piece is going to call for or masks or whatever has it. And then um, sometimes you have a, a technician who is a fabric dyer who they manipulate the color of the fabric through dyeing and paint and batik and shibori and all kinds of other um, embellishment like that. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. I hadn't really thought about, sh I mean, you had mentioned shoes being part of this whole design process. And I recall once reading a costume designer for film talking about how if you're doing sort of a, a futuristic or a sci-fi film that the, the shoes can be the most challenging part because oh, yeah. <laughs> footwear is hard to sort of make futuristic while still making it functional. Right. Uh, I mean, and this is something too with, with uh, film costume designers, I think particularly back to like the golden age of Hollywood, you know, we look back on a film from 1940 um, that film was being shot in 1939 or maybe even 1938. And so that meant the costume designer, because they didn't have a time machine, they weren't trying to recreate fashions of the moment because by the time that film went to release, they'd be passe. So they would have to try to anticipate where they thought fashion was going to go. Oh, um, that's interesting. And, that, and yeah. that's not really a pressure that a theater costume designer feels, right? Not as much because our audience tends to be smaller and, and so much of our work, uh, you know, is, is contemporary. Theater has a much shorter turnaround time between first rehearsal and opening night, you know, especially in America. Um, when I worked at the Goodman Theater, we would have three 40-hour um, weeks of rehearsal and then a week of dress rehearsal and then we open. Um, so designs are done, you know, two to three months in advance of opening night. So there's there's much less uh, time for the fashion impulse to change, although it does seem like it speeds up every day. Interesting. And I was also wondering about sort of um, what a costumier might need to do if you're trying to reverse engineer a garment. So obviously Lala Asadi, as you pointed out, is drawing on these traditional um, sort of patterns. So they might be ones that are very familiar to her and the women that she's working with. But if someone, for example, showed you this picture of Silence of Thought number two and asked you, well, we need a costume that looks like that, but you don't have sort of a, you know, a full standing view of it. Um, is there a way that you sort of learn the design thinking needed to, you know, figure out the kind of costume you need based on the reference photos? Yeah, well, the first thing you do is go to a library or a museum database um, or your collection of books, you know, in your studio and, and you try to research, um, you know, it, particularly if this is set in a particular time or place, right? Um, uh, we would try to find, you know, what did people wear in this time and place and what did they look like? Um, and there, there are all kinds of um, books and exhibitions and other resource materials out there that show you um, not only, you know, here's this garment, but also here's how it was made. Um, oh, and so I look at photographs, I look at, um, you know, garments from uh, museum um, textile co collections, um, I look at pattern books, um, and then you just kind of experiment, you get a, a, a dress form and you drape the fabric on it or, or develop a pattern flat and then put it on the um, tailor and check it on your actor and ask yourself, you know, did, did I get it right? Does this look like the idea in my head? And then um, manipulate it and adjust it from there. So yeah, a lot of research. A lot of research. And, and like I said, like the design thing, the problem solving that you have to do in making this work is I think really fascinating. Well, absolutely, because lots of times, you know, your research is, is paintings, you know, you go back before, you know, 1700, and there really isn't a lot of existing uh, textiles. And those that do exist tend to have been altered over time, mm -hmm. because someone in 1850 took Granny's 1750 gown and retailored it for a costume ball. Um, so uh, you have to look at paintings or sculpture or other things. And, and of course, you know, um, Paintings are all photoshopped. Right? That they they can be. That is true. They can be idealized by the painter, and reality is manipulated for the painter's uh, goal um, with their art. And so you kind of have to try to, as you say, reverse engineer. You know, how does this actually work? And so lots of times, if I look at a, you know, a picture of a painting, um, of a portrait, and then I 
sometimes there is an existing garment um, from that same era and you put them side by side and you're like, oh yeah, hmm. Didn't exactly look the same on an actual body as this kind of idealized painting. And so you need to adjust for that as well. Well, we have a, a theater Fairfield alumna, Michelle Rakowski, uh, putting in a question, going back, I guess, to this idea of potentially some manipulation and how the artist works. And she's wondering what you think about the way that the artist arranges the eye contact of the model. So not specifically costume, but, you know, you said that the costume leads to the eye. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting, um, you know, in this slide that we have here, obviously her, her gaze is not on us. She's ignoring us entirely. Um, and and is you know perhaps lost in her own thoughts or, or pointed elsewhere. There are other photographs um, in the, in this exhibition where the women are looking directly at it at the camera. Um, and Dr. Becker was saying in her talk when you compare Asadi's photos to the kind of exotic postcard photos from from the past, um, there's a totally different level of comfort. Um, with the models in Asadi's work versus the, the models for these postcards. Um, Dr. Becker feels that the models in the postcards often look uncomfortable or kind of put on the spot um, and, and um, not at ease with their setting and surroundings and by being photographed. And Asadi, when she does her photo sessions, these are often with friends or family and people that she knows. And um, this art of putting the henna on the body is an hours long process. Um, so so this isn't just, you know, show up in the studio, here's your costume. Okay, gonna take your photo, great, get out. This is, a, this is an event. Um, and so I think they build a rapport um, and, and a comfort level that puts everybody at their ease so that they're ready um, to, to be just naturally posed in these photos. Um, so, but I love that, you know, it's, it's we are looking in on their lives and they are living it and, and we can make of it what we will, but they're not there for us mm -hmm. to stare at them. Yeah. So we have another question from Susie that's kind of taking us on a different tack toward your professional career. And um, she said, your talk is so interesting and wonderful. I have costume I have costume design experience with small theater groups and would love to do more. Do you recommend getting an agent in order to find work? Uh, um, well, I can't really speak to that because my track is in academia. Um, and, and now I work full time um, for university and, and do gigs on the side. And of course, 2020, 2021, I feel like we're in this moment where we're rewriting the rules of how this is all going to work going forward um, and just where is theater going to actually be um, as we go forward. I mean, I think, um, you know, there is a design uh, union for costume designers, um, USA and United Scenic Artists. And um, so that is one way to, to get, you know, the protection of numbers and collective bargaining and, and those sorts of safety measures in place. Um, because theater, like most um, industry, there's, there's, um, it's really easy to be exploited. Um, and I would just say, don't ever do anything for experience fun bucks, right? Because you, you can't eat those. <laughs> um, but know the, try to know the value of your work and recognize how many hours it takes you to do what, what your work is. And and um, you know, demand to be to be valued accordingly. Right? Um, but usually, I mean, most theaters, right, you, it's, it's about relationship developing. You've worked with a director and they work somewhere else and they remember your work and they call you back. The theater world is very small. Um, so getting to know other designers as well. I've gotten gigs where, um, you know, a colleague ha has been offered the position and they're like, oh, I can't because I'm doing this other thing over here. Oh, but I wonder if Julie's free. And then I get the call. That's great. Those are both really good insights about not working for exposure and the importance of, of networking and relationship building, particularly if any of our, our student audience might be listening. That's something that could be very helpful for them to hear. Sure. Um, and I think we'll wrap up because I get to I get to give you the final question. Uh, <laughs> and this goes back to Theater Fairfield. It goes back to your work in the costume shop. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at Lala Sadi's work and I know from what um, Dr. Becker has written that she will often sort of reuse these props that she has made, these costumes. Um, and I wondered sort of what is the, the life cycle of a costume in Theatre Fairfield and how long does it, what, what does it go through? I assume you don't just make every costume brand new for every production. You would, you would never stop working. Exactly. Right. And, and you just can't. Right. Um, so we try to be um, frugal. And, and actually, this is another kind of point of inflection with, with costume making at the moment, this um, Broadway going green kind of initiative where we're trying to really think consciously about 
our use of materials and resource and processes um, to make a, a lesser impact on the planet because um, costume design can be very wasteful. Fashion can be very wasteful, particularly when we're doing fast fashion um, and those sorts of things. So yeah, I mean, when, when I am presented with a show um, and I'm doing my designs, I try to think about, you know, what do we have in stock that I could reuse um, that's appropriate? Um, you know, could I make this outfit work? Well, yeah, but I might want to retrim it or I might want to dye it a different color or whatever. Um, and then, um, if I'm buying things, I try to see what can I buy secondhand? Can I rent something? There are great um, theater companies out there that will rent costumes to you. Um, Oregon Shakespeare Festival is one. They put all of their stock online. Um, and if you're a working costume designer, you can go online and, and like checking things out of a library um, kind of thing. And so that's great because, because we know somebody fantastic has already built it. And so it's going to work the way you want it to and hold up under the stress of, of a theater production. Um, and it's a big money and labor saver and you're giving it new life. Um, so yeah, I mean, but you know, t-shirts and socks, they can, <laughs> we will use those over and over again until they're just like, we're done. Um, particularly <laughs> in a theater setting because we have students that are gonna be with us for four years. And so if you come in as a freshman and I label your t-shirt, you might still be able to get to wear that t-shirt your senior year. <laughs> <laughs> An inspiration for anyone looking to um, pursue theater in college, come to Fairfield, work with Julie. Oh, absolutely. I love teaching students um, the basics of it. And I've, I've had students, we, at Fairfield, we have um, a thing called an independent project. Um, every year where students submit a proposal that say, we want to, we want to basically form our own theater company for this one show. And they'll do everything from casting to rehearsals to costumes to set building. Um, so I'm here to teach you the skills to get you to that point. And then that's great for your resume as you go off into the world after school. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Julie. This was wonderful. Uh, thank, thank you, you so for much. everyone who has been watching. Um, again, you can go to fairfield.edu slash museum slash Lala Asadi if you want to check out some of her work, take the virtual tour, get a sense of what Julie mentioned, the beautiful scale of these photographs. And we will look forward to seeing you at our next event. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much.